Right, what's happening, people? Welcome back to the Joey Knight Podcast and welcome to my final thoughts ahead of Sunday's match against Aston Villa. In this video, I'm going to give you my starting 11 for the match against Aston Villa and look at how close that will be to Mauricio Pochettino's starting 11, in my opinion. I'm also going to speak about Aston Villa and the threats that they poise to Chelsea in this match. I'm going to give you a lot of my reasons why I believe we can beat Villa and I'm going to finish it off by giving you a score prediction for this match. Right, so let's start off with my starting 11. I'm going to go with a 4 2 3 1 formation and I'm going to go. Sanchez in goal. Right back, Melo Gusto. I'm going to go a centre-back pairing of Thiago Silva and Levi Colwell. But I am very aware that that's probably quite unlikely. Let's be honest. We're going to see Colwell at left-back, aren't we? Mauricio Pochettino is not budging from this little project of having Colwell at left-back. And even in the last match against Bournemouth, he actually dropped Ben Chilwell, who has been an important player for us so far. He had been playing him left wing. Obviously, Mudrick came in in that match. It was good to see him get minutes. I, personally, would have Colwell in that centre-back position and go Chilwell at left-back. Now, let me just touch on Colwell here. I think Colwell is massively, massively wasted at left back. And I'm going to give you a reason why. At the moment, we're lacking a little bit of creativity. And the first place that our mind will jump to when we think about creativity will be further up the pitch. However, Levi Colwell is elite, in my opinion, at cutting balls straight through the lines and starting attacks out of relative sort of positions where you wouldn't believe we're in a position to be able to start an attack straight away. You see some of the passes that he was making for for Brighton, and even so far this season, especially against Liverpool, I was seeing it, some of the balls that he was putting through are really, really good. And I think if we had Enzo Fernandez in front of him, he could turn defence into attack very, very quickly. And I think he's just wasted over in that left-back slot. And as well... You look at left-back, we've got Chilwell there, we've got Ian Matson there, we've even got Kukurea, a player that I haven't been too high on, but we've got three recognised left-backs at the club. I just don't think we need to be playing Levi Colwell there. I think he's the future of England in that left centre-back position. He's definitely going to take the mantle from Harry Maguire sooner rather than later. So I really, really want to see him there in that left centre-back position. Now, my two in the midfield pivot. The first one is going to be Enzo Fernandez. I do want to see him back a little bit deeper. And I'm contradicting myself here because earlier on in the season, I was saying that I'd like to see him pushed a little bit further up. But actually, I think as the games go on, I think we should drop him back there. I think he's better coming in from deeper and feeding the ball onto the more creative players in those areas who are used to playing in those areas. So I would have Enzo Fernandez there. Now, Caicedo hasn't played for us since the international break. He picked up, I think it was a knee injury. Obviously, he missed the game against Bournemouth. Now, Caicedo did not train through the week. However, I've just listened to Mauricio Pochettino's press conference ahead of the game. And Poch said that there is a chance he'll be in contention for that match but I do think that when it comes to all the injuries we've picked up and how we surely must be guilty of being a little bit negligent when it comes to rushing these players back I think that Caicedo should probably sit this one out or come off late on um, off the bench. Let's be honest, though. When he came on late off the bench against West Ham, he didn't have a very good game, did he? So maybe he'll sit out altogether. Anyway, the reason why it's not so much of a negative thing is because of Uga Chukwu. Uga Chukwu looked brilliant against Bournemouth, in my opinion. For a young 19-year-old player, he's calm, composed. He has a really good range of passing. And he didn't look sort of overawed by the occasion. He looked like a player that could slot very, very well into this Chelsea side as it is right now. And my good friend Josh Aveste, who comes on the podcast as a regular guest, obviously said to me that there's got to be some sort of method behind the thinking that Pochettino was prepared to let Andre Santos play that we had seen in preseason and we we're very impressed by go out on loan to Nottingham Forest, yet he wasn't ready to let Ugochukwu go. And as we're seeing Ugochukwu play, I'm starting to realise maybe why that was. So the silver lining to having Lavia out injured, Caicedo out injured, is we do have Ugochukwu and he is ready to come in and perform to a very high level, in my opinion. Now, in front of those two sitting in the pivot, we're obviously going to have three behind the striker. I'm going to start off with the easy one. It picks itself it's Raheem Sterling. Raheem Sterling's looked class so far this season. Obviously, he was very, very unlucky to not get a goal against Bournemouth, which would have continued his hot run in this team so far. And um, Raheem Sterling is a man that we're going to have to rely on at the minute for a lot of our creativity to come from and a lot of our positive opportunities when it comes to trying to create and score goals to come from. Raheem Sterling starts on that right-hand side. 
I'll skip the 10 for the second. I'll go over to the left-hand side. The left-hand side in this game, for me, was a really, really hard choice because after I've given you my lineup, I'm going to speak about the players that just about missed out. And one of the players that does just about miss out here is a player that I really, really want to see getting a lot more first team minutes than he's getting at the second. However, I think that we should give Mikhailo Mudrik another run out. And the reason for that is he did look lively at the start of that match against Bournemouth. However, being that we're playing and Levi Colwell at left back and he's got nowhere near the amount of creativity when stretched out wide as Ben Chilwell does have we saw a lot of the play go down the right hand side against Bournemouth and I do believe we would have sort of seen the percentage of how much the play is shared when it comes to what flank it's on I sort of think we'd have seen that percentage split a lot more or evened out a lot more I should say if we had Ben Chilwell at left back behind Mikhailo Mudrik so being that I am starting Ben Chilwell and not Levi Colwell at left back I would play Mikhailo Mudrik there. Mudrik has shown good link-up play with the players around him in pre-season. Obviously, he looked quite good against Bournemouth in that match last Sunday. And I do think that if we're truly going to cast any sort of judgment, which we've all been guilty of at times, including myself, on Mikhailo Mudrik and whether he's going to live up to the fee and whether we overspent on him or anything like that, we need to give him six, seven starts in a row to be able to definitively say whether or not he is a first-team starter at the minute. He's not been able to prove himself because he's not had the minutes. Now, to counter that, I'd say that whether you're getting the minutes or not, a good player will make himself irreplaceable in a team, and Mikhailo Mudrik hasn't done that so far. But we need to give him the minutes under Pochettino, the starts under Pochettino, to be able to sort of take the weight off his shoulders, play a bit of football, and then we can truly analyse just how good Mikhailo Mudrik is or not. In the 10... I'm starting Cole Palmer. This needs to be the match that he gets his first start for Chelsea Football Club. Cole Palmer has impressed me massively when he came on against Nottingham Forest, a match that I was at. Obviously, he looked good when he came on against Bournemouth, albeit not being able to be the man that scored us the goal or created the goal, but he is getting the opportunities. He's getting into those positions. And I think with a young player, much like we've seen in Mikhailo Mudrik, we do need to get him into that starting eleven sooner rather than later because the longer it goes on, the longer or the more opportunity, I should say, his confidence is going to have to sort of dampen a little bit. And I think in Cole Palmer, he's come from a Man City side. OK, he wasn't a first team starter every week, but he was training with them. He was getting minutes off the bench. He had started this season quite well. Obviously, his goal in the Community Shield against Arsenal being a really good one. And I think that if you play for Man City, if you play for any team managed by Pep Guardiola, you are going to be schooled in breaking down a low block. And you're going to be used to teams setting up very, very defensive against Against you. So for that reason, although I don't necessarily think that Villa are going to set up defensively against us, I do think that having Cole Palmer in that 10 is going to really, really benefit us. Also, I'm going to give it away now. I'm starting Nicholas Jackson up front, of course. He is pretty much the only option we got at the minute. And I think that Nicholas Jackson has been a little bit harshly done by. I do think that when he gets his confidence, when he gets his striking boots on, he's going to come good for us. But what I would say is this. A few times, Nicholas Jackson has been asked to sort of drop deep to create stuff for himself. We saw it with a shot that he hit the post with against Bournemouth. He was the one that sort of had to create that coming in from wide. And I don't think that that's going to suit his game best. I think he needs a creative player in behind him. We look at the link-up play he had with Nkunku in pre-season and Kunku in that 10 role was complementing Nicholas Jackson very well so I do think that instead of Nicholas Jackson dropping in to get the ball he needs someone behind him who can create the opportunities for him and in Cole Palmer I do very much think we have that player it might not happen straight away but we need to bed him in we need to give him minutes and we need to give him the opportunity to create a relationship with Nicholas Jackson so one of the first exclusions that will come to mind here is Connor Gallagher now Connor Gallagher is a player that I really don't understand why but he gets a lot of harsh criticism from the fans from other teams they don't think he's a very good player and I very much would disagree with that however just because I think Conor Gallagher is a really good player and I think that he's really coming to fruition this season you know given the captain's armband against AFC Wimbledon and then again against Bournemouth I think that it's going to be really really positive for Conor Gallagher when he's looking at the way that Mauricio Pochettino sees him in this system and in this team I think there's bigger and better things to come from him and I think he'll be a really important player for us moving forward but in this match in particular I wouldn't start Conor Gallagher I'd have him on the bench and I would go for a slightly more creative team. However, to counter that, I'm pretty adamant that we're going to see him in the starting 11. Uh, Mauricio Pochettino has showed so far that Conor Gallagher's his man. You know, Conor Gallagher is a player that was linked with a move away 
in pre-season. And even at the start of this season, and Poch keeps on picking him. And if Poch likes him, then I am willing to back it. And I like Conor Gallagher too. I think he's very, very good. But for this lineup, I wouldn't pick him. Another absentee from my first 11 would be Ian Matson. Now, when I spoke about Mikhailo Mudrik, there was a large part of me that really wanted to put Ian Matson there. I want to see Ian Matson playing. I don't actually want to see him at left back either. I think he's a little bit wasted there. I know he played there for Burnley, but he is a real, real creative threat for us. And when we're lacking creativity, he's a player that I do think could come in, slot him well to this side and do a really good job. But the thing is, where I would play him would obviously be in place of Mikhailo Mudrik. He's not getting in the team ahead of Sterling right now. We need Sterling's experience. We need his talent. We need his creativity and we need his know-how on the pitch. And that means that Matson's only going to come in ahead of Mudrik and... It's a hard decision to make, you know, but I do honestly believe that in Matson, we know we've got a really good talent on our hands. And although we're waiting to see more from him, we know what direction it's heading in, in my opinion. In Mudrik, there's a little bit of uncertainty. So that's why I want to give Mudrik the game time to prove to me, to you lot, to us as a fan base, that he is a man that we can hang our hat on. So Mudrik starts there instead of Matson. Caicedo, I've touched on. He's been out injured, um, and I just don't think we need to rush him back in this match. Obviously, De Sassi losing his place in this lineup. At the moment, I think that Thiago Silva and Levi Colo is a better pairing. However, after this match, if we were to see him in a pairing, my mind could slightly change. Um, I was a little bit harsh on De Sassi at first. Last couple of performances, I think he's been a lot better. Now, Aston Villa are a very, very impressive outfit at the moment. When it comes to attacking threat, if you take away Liverpool and Man City, I put them up there on their day in terms of a starting eleven with anyone. Zaniola, Diaby, Leon Bailey, Buendia, Jacob Rams even, who's injured at the moment. The list goes on. And not only that, they have something or someone, I should say, that is in pretty short demand in modern day football and that is a goal scoring number nine. Now, Ollie Watkins might not be your traditional number nine, but let's be honest, who cares if he's scoring goals? It's good for the Villa fans and at the moment, he's yet to get off the mark this season, but I think it's only a matter of time before he opens his account. You look at last season, really, really impressive. Had a great run of form. He got 21 goal involvements. I think 15 of them were goals and obviously the rest assists and Ollie Watkins is a player that can cause us a significant threat in this match. But Watkins, nor any of the names that I have just mentioned, are Villa's biggest threat, in my opinion. And Villa's biggest threat, Villa's biggest asset is their manager, Unai Emery. Unai Emery has done a ridiculously good job since coming into a struggling at the time Villa side. He's completely transformed them. I know that they lost um, on Thursday night in the Europa Conference League, but there's a reason why they're the favourite for that competition. The bookies have them at five to one at the minute, and I think the next favourites are Frankfurt, who are ten to one. So that really does say it all. Although they lost, I back them to go on and win that competition. And I think that Unai Emery is a man that has very, very quickly become a fan favourite amongst Villa fans. So at the moment, things are looking bright for Villa. The players, for the most part, are performing. The club are doing really well. There's a lot of stability there, and that's actually a far cry from what we're seeing at my club Chelsea at the minute. So why do I think that Chelsea can beat Villa? Well, I actually have three reasons. And the first is that Villa played on Thursday night. Thursday night obviously saw Aston Villa make the trip to Poland to face Legia Warsaw. And although the team was rotated ever so slightly, there was a lot of players that started that match and came on in that match, which I can very much imagine will be in the starting lineup for Villa on Sunday. Now, before a ball was kicked, one of the things that accredited Chelsea as having going in their favour this season is the fact that we don't have European competition to contend with. We're going to have more rest in between fixtures, you know. And if we are going to benefit from that, albeit the season hasn't started exactly how we would have wanted. This is the match to do it in. Aston Villa have just played Thursday night. It's a trip to Poland. It's not that far away, but their players should be a little bit fatigued from that, hopefully. And the second reason why I believe we can beat Villa is that Villa are shipping goals at the moment. So far this season, they've conceded 10 goals, okay? We've only conceded five, to be fair. And when they have lost to the likes of Liverpool and Newcastle, they have shipped a couple of goals. And our defence, to be honest, I know you know, we conceded three against West Ham, but barring that, our defences look pretty solid in my opinion. And look, I'll counter it by saying this. Obviously, Villa have scored 11 goals. We've only scored five. So if I could take their stats and be seventh in the league, I obviously would rather than where we are sat at the minute. But... I've got to take some sort of hope or optimism from somewhere, haven't I? So you can forgive me in that. Now, at the minute, obviously, we rank second bottom when it comes to chance conversion. I think it's only Everton that have missed more big chances than Chelsea so far this season. But being that Villa are there to be got at, 
surely we're going to have enough opportunities. And if we can have a little bit of luck go in our favour, a little bit more precision and confidence from the players to get the ball in the back of the net, we are going to have the opportunity to score many times in this match probably against Villa. And I do honestly believe we will do so. And the third and final reason why I honestly believe that we can beat Aston Villa in this match is because we are better. Now listen, football is a team sport and that means that individual brilliance is only brilliant if it is amongst a team that is performing well. And at the moment, obviously, our team isn't performing that well and Villa's is. But let's be honest, how many of Villa's players would make it into our starting eleven? For me, Martinez in goal, Diaby out wide, and probably Watkins at the minute when you see the fact that Nicholas Jackson is not finishing his chances. And that means that a combined 11 between us and Aston Villa would be heavily stacked in our favour. And I think even honest Villa fans would admit that if you could guarantee that Unai Emery would have these players performing to the exact same standard that he's got his current players performing, they would obviously take a lot of our players over their players. But again, I get that it's not just about individual brilliance. And that is why Villa are a really, really tough match for us this weekend. But... You know, we need to click at some point, don't we? And if we don't pick up points in this match against Villa and our next league match against Fulham, it makes it a really, really daunting prospect to then go and try and get points in the upcoming run of fixtures we have where we've obviously got some really, really hard matches. And then because of the way that Chelsea played last season, people will be looking at it and thinking, well, they played shit last season. They're going to be shit this season again. And obviously, look, the way we've performed so far, there would be some sort of weight to that argument. But what I would say is last season was a different team. Look at the 11s that are starting this season. Not many of them were involved last season. And also... We've got a different manager now. So although it's very easy to draw a straight line from last season to this season, especially with the start we've had, I don't believe it's as plain and simple as Chelsea were playing rubbish then. They're going to play rubbish now because I believe that we're bedding a lot of new players in. We're trying to get used to a manager's new system, new formation. And obviously, we've got a lot of expectation on our shoulders. A lot of people are looking at us and going, OK, we give you a pass last season. Well, they won't. Everyone's hating on us about last season still, and it's already over now. But... We give you a pass last season, but you need to come good this season. And so far, bearing in mind the fixtures that we've had, we should have done better. I am open to hold my hands up and admit that. But if things start to come good in the next couple of weeks, then that's going to be a distant memory. And, you know, a couple of good results, a couple of good wins can change everything. I refuse right now to rule us out of the Champions League race, being that, you know, five spots are going to get you Champions League football. I don't think that five games into a season, when we've seen what's gone on in the past with teams that have had a late push, and it wouldn't even be a late with five games into the season, I don't believe that you can definitively rule Chelsea out of any sort of race for Champions League football, definitely Europa League football. So, but we just need to start getting these wins on board. And I do believe that in Pochettino, we have the right manager. We need to be patient. I've said this time and time again, what's the alternative? We can't be hiring and firing like we did under Abramovich because we're not under Abramovich no more. You know, those are good times, but again, they're a distant memory also. So we are where we are. We need to deal with it. We need to get behind the boys. And all that being said, my match prediction be very, very easy for me after giving you all those reasons why I believe Chelsea can win to then go and back us winning. But one thing I promised to myself when I started doing YouTube, when I started doing this podcast is that I wouldn't lie and I'll be honest to myself in my predictions and in what I thought. And for that reason, I'm going to have to go a score draw in this match. But I'd very, very much like to be proven wrong. And quite a few times recently when I backed us to win, I have been proven wrong. So maybe there's a little bit psychological going on there where I am believing that if I back us for a draw, we might then get a win could happen. But anyway, listen, people, I'm very, very interested to know what you lot think. I will be live on the kickoff on Sunday. We're going to be watching the North London derby between Tottenham and Arsenal, but I will be keeping an eye on the Chelsea against Villa match on the other screen. And I will obviously be talking all things Chelsea on the kickoff. So please do me a massive favour. If you are a fan of this channel, make sure that you catch me and Josh, a channel fan favourite, on the kickoff this Sunday. I think we're live from 1.30pm. Also, if you made it to the end of this video, please do me a massive favour hit subscribe and also click the bell so that you get a notification every time one of my videos goes live. And finally, let me know your thoughts in the comments. I want to know, as always, when you see these previews and predictions, I want to know your starting 11, who you would start against Villa for Chelsea and your score predictions. When this video goes live, I will be reading all of the comments. I'll try and get back to as many of you as I possibly can. So let me know your thoughts in the comments and I will see you all in the next one.